So uh, we'll be talking a little bit about DVT and P. I'd like to uh, try and focus more on what is you know kind of relevant for the cardiologists and uh, not go over a lot of the essentials that you've already covered in internal medicine. So we will be uh, touching a little bit upon some of the trials which have been done in uh, acute P, mainly massive, submassive P, and the use of thrombolytics and uh, uh, looking at those. So. Um, uh, again, you know, as you all know, uh, venous thromboembolism, it's a blood clotting condition with two really major manifestations. One is DVT and the other one is PE. And um, most of them really present as DVT, though a lot of the times patients who present with PE have had a DVT but never have had symptomatic DVT. Now, 40% uh, of the patients who have PE have had a proximal DVT and uh, 70% um, of the patients who've had uh, P are found to have uh, a DVT of the lower extremities. And really when you look at the DVTs of up, upper extremities versus lower extremity, the, the, DV, the PE risk is much lower with uh, upper extremity compared to lower extremity. When you, um, it's about 3 to 5% versus 1%, so which is why there is a lot of debate in terms of anticoagulating upper limb DVTs. So, um, but, you know, one thing uh, you really have to keep in mind is that both DVT and P, as cavalier as we are with them, the mortality is very, very high. You know, one month after diagnosis of PE, you know, mortality is about 12% and about 6% with DVT. You know, granted, not all of them die from PE or DVT. A lot of them have underlying conditions which, you know, lead to increased mortality. But uh, um, it is associated with increased mortality. Now, risk factors for uh, VT, um, most of you are aware of this. So, you know, f f uh, orthopedic procedures, fr you know, fractures, hip replacement, major general surgery, major trauma, spinal cord injury, you know, again, intermediate risk factors with central lines, chemotherapy, hormone replacement, malignancy, uh, and weak risk factors, which are, you know, bed rest and uh, uh, air travel, obesity. Uh, uh, again, most of the patients with uh, thromboembolism have at least one risk factor. So this again, I you know I don't have to uh, elaborate more. Yeah, the, uh, it, it, you guys have all seen DVTs. You guys have all taken care of peas in the past. So. Um, people come in with uh, swelling, redness, and a lack of, uh, occasionally lack of distal pulses. Uh, but uh, you always look for underlying causes and coexisting conditions uh, because, uh, you know, that's how you kind of choose your pretest probability for DVT depending on whether the patient has active cancer, you know, immobilization, recent uh, bedridden status and, uh, um, you know, go over some of the uh, clinical signs and symptoms with leg swelling, calf swelling and tenderness and uh, having an alternative diagnosis. Um, and then based on this, whether you have low probability or high probability, you choose your test, whether it's D-dimer or venous to play. And then uh, if you have a negative venous duplay, then you repeat another ultrasound, especially if your pretest probability is, uh, is intermediate to high. And then if with two ultrasounds, if you're, um, you're negative, then you don't have a DVT. So switching gears here, you know, clinical presentations with uh, pulmonary embolism. So most of the patients, you know, uh, present with dyspnea pleuritic chest pain, uh, few of them with hemoptysis. Those with hemoptysis, uh, really more of the, you know, uh, massive to submassive P's. Uh, and again, initial evaluation in the ER, even, you know, uh, even though for the board purposes, you have to know your S1, Q3, T3, and uh, your Hammond sign on, on uh, the, uh, the chest X-ray and the peripheral plethora uh, and all these things. But really, when you're making a diagnosis, it uh, you really look at, you know, doing a CTP protocol, at least in this country. So uh, the big thing to think about when you're looking at initial stratification of PE is to look for whether the patient has shock or hypotension because your diagnostic uh, algorithm uh, will change depending on whether you're high risk or not so high risk. 
So this is uh, an example of you know what you would see in a uh, saddle embolus uh, with a uh, you know big uh, uh, P there, um, and uh, again it's very similar to the Wells uh, risk score. You know you look at alternative diagnosis for uh, other than less likely than PE clinical signs and symptoms of DVT, because as we uh, you know, discussed earlier, about 70% of the patients with PE have a DVT. Um, and heart rate greater than 100 minutes, previous PE, recent surgery, cancer, hemoptysis. So based on this, you come up with a you know, score and uh, you calculate your pre probability. And uh, depending on that, you decide what to do. If you have low probability, then you get a D-dimer, uh, and then if you have a positive D-dimer, then you get a CTPA protocol or a, a VQ scan, depending on the availability. Now, if you have intermediate to high risk, then you just straight away go to CTPA protocol. Um, again, now what you do in patients without shock or hypotension, then you kind of follow the protocol that, that was there before. But in patients who are in the ER or in the ICU and you get called for hypotension and you have a high probability for PE, then uh, you, know, you really have to just switch to, you know, go to CT angio. Now, if that's not available or the patient's really tenuous, then you know, stick an echo probe. You know, if you feel that the patient has bad RV failure and the RV is not moving at all, then and the patient's hypoxic, then you know um, uh, you need to rush them down for a CTPA protocol right away. But if not, then you really need to uh, think about uh, whether you should reperfuse the patient uh, right away. Now switching gears here, you know. When you look at all the trials, there are three big terms you're, you'll see. These are, these are what the trials that I'm talking about are the trials for thrombolytics. Uh, you look at massive P, you look at submassive P, and there is this uh, another term called intermediate P, which is not massive. So uh, how do you define it? And uh, really, you, you, know, you define it based on the presence of hypotension, and are you based, uh, based on the presence of signs of RV dysfunction. So if you look at massive P, you're looking at patients with sustained hypotension, <coughs> pulselessness, and or persistent profound bradycardia from bad uh, you know, RV failure. Now submassive P's, you're, you're looking at acute P's without systemic hypotension, but with RV dysfunction or myocardial necrosis. So either you need to have RV dysfunction on the echo. For most of the trials, what they've looked at when they define RV dysfunction is they've looked at RV to LV ratio. If their ratio is greater than 0.9, then that's how they have defined, you know, RV dysfunction. Now, of course, in the presence of if you're B and P, the cutoff there is uh, is 150 for a few trials, um, and uh, if you're looking at NT pro B and P, it's over 500 for most of the trials, uh, and um, any troponin leak. Uh, is another. So if you get, have BNP being elevated or troponin being elevated, or if your RV to LV ratio is greater than 0.9, uh, in the absence of hypotension, then uh, you know, you're uh, looking at a submassive P. Um, so you know, why should we give thrombolytics, at least from the trials? There is, uh, patients have resolution of dyspnea much faster than patients do with just uh, heparin alone. Uh, documented clot resolution is much faster with thrombolytics. Decreased recurrence of PE. Now, decreased death alone uh, has been, um, it's a wash. You know, some trials have shown that there is uh, decreased death, but the largest trial, the PETO trial, uh, showed that when you look at a composite index of decreased death and hemodynamic compromise at seven days, then there is a definite difference with pe people getting thrombolytics versus not. And definitely decreased pulmonary hypertension. So what are the disadvantages? You know, it's, it's like any giving thrombolytic for any other reason that a big problem is bleeding. Uh, and uh, you're looking at an IC, you know, intracerebral hemorrhage of uh, over 2% in patients over 75 and other bleeding of up to you know, 6% in the PETO trial. Um, and in, in some really rare uh, places in the US where you don't have TPA, then you can use uh, streptokinase or urokinase. But you know, I mean, here it's, uh, it's 
it's available everywhere. Now, the, the dose uh, which was given here is, is from the PETO trial, uh, where they used uh, really a full dose of 100 milligrams uh, uh, over two hours um, with a bolus. Um, now, yeah, we'll talk about it in, the, in, in this slide. Um, uh, now, about there, were, there was a meta-analysis of 16 trials comparing thrombolytics and anticoagulation to anticoagulation alone, and really number treated to treat for all-cause mortality benefit in that meta-analysis was 59. Now, like I said, no trial on its own has shown benefit uh, for mortality alone, but only when you combine it with he, you know, hemodynamic compromise. Uh, it's been statistically significant. So, but in this meta-analysis, you know, th there was a cl clear mortality benefit. Um, now, uh, uh, of course, in those 2,000 patients, most of the patients were either in the PITO trial or in the MOPET trial. Uh, now, the difference between the PITO and the MOPET trials were the dosage of thrombolytics, because what they saw in the PITO trial was that uh, um, the, uh, the rates of uh, hemorrhage were, were high, so they wanted to see if half those thrombolytics, you know, had the same effect while as decreased uh, uh, the hemorrhagic risk. And, uh, but, but unfortunately, the, the definitions in both these trials were so different that you really can't make a head-to-head -head comparison. Because in PETO trial, they used the definition of massive versus submassive PE, whereas in the MAPE trial, they used intermediate uh, PE as a definition, which was a little bit different because what they did to define intermediate was they looked at how big the clot was. You know, did it occlude 70% of the main PA or was, did it include, you know, both the PAs? Or, so it was not really, and they did take some hemodynamic parameters into consideration, but uh, they also looked at the clot burden, which was different from the PITO trial. So, uh, but in the MAPET trial, again, it was uh, very um, uh, successful in the sense that their endpoint was uh, incidence of pH at, uh, you know, during long-term follow-up, and they definitely saw an absolute risk reduction, 40 percent at 28 months. So overall, you know, both these trials have shown that when you use thrombolytics for not only the sickest ones with hypotension and, you know, bradycardia, but also for patients with ma submassive or intermediate PE, there is a, a definite um, benefit, albeit, you know, the, with an increased risk of bleeding. So uh, this is just a slide showing all the newer uh, oral anticoagulants, and really the take home really is that the newer ones, for the most part, all of them are as good or slightly better than warfarin with definitely lesser, you know, bleeding risk for maybe, you know, uh, apixaban for sure, uh, and maybe slightly for rivaroxaban. Um, again, you know, you guys all know about contraindications to thrombolysis, you know, if you've had stroke, you know, any stroke, hemorrhagic, ischemic, and any central uh, nervous system neoplasms. Now the question is whether to uh, also include age has been you know thrown around because there is definite high you know risk of bleeding with uh, um, intracerebral bleeding with giving thrombolytics to patients over the age of 75, but uh, you know it's not really made it into the guidelines yet. So another thing to just touch up upon here is uh, you know in, in patients who are not candidates for anticoagulation. Uh, venous filters should be, you know, uh, considered, but again, really in, in nowadays there are retrievable filters, so those should be considered so that after three months, in, in case the patient's acute thing resolves where they do become candidates for anticoagulation, they can be, you know, taken out. Uh, so again, in patients who uh, have shock, you know, you can definitely perform surgical embolectomy. Again, this has to be done in the OR with cardiopulmonary bypass support. And uh, now, transvenous catheter embolectomy, you know, can be done, but oftentimes it is um, incomplete uh, and, you know, doesn't lead to complete resolution. So if you're going to really, you know, go do the uh, embolectomy, it's advised to just take them to the OR, take, put them on cardiopulmonary bypass and do a complete job. All right, thank you very much.